Bonjour, mesdames et messieurs. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to another session of the CSPC interview series. And we are pleased to have with us uh, today, Dr. John Hepburn, CEO and Scientific Director of MyThax, who is on the job since February of 2020. Uh, welcome uh, to the uh, program, Dr. Hepburn. Nice to be here. Thank you very much, uh, Meridad, for the opportunity. Excellent. We are pleased to have you with us. Uh, just a bit of background and biography for Dr. Hepburn to be very brief. Uh, the, Dr. Hepburn has an extensive academic and research experience and background with industry and international partners, and he has a deep knowledge and, um, of and also commitment to the innovation ecosystem. Uh, prior to his role, uh, Dr. Uh, Hepburn was the Vice President of Research and Partnership at CIFAR. And prior to that, uh, he was at UBC when he has the faculty appointment. He was the Vice President of Research and International, and prior to that, Dean of Faculty of Science and Head of the Department of Chemistry. Dr. Hepburn earned his PhD in Chemistry uh, from University of Toronto. He received uh, numerous awards and honors, including Rutherford Medal in Physics from the Royal Society of Canada. He is a fellow of the Royal Society of Canada and a former uh, Canada Council Helium Research Fellow. Welcome aboard, Dr. Hubbard, and glad to have you with us. Thank you very much. Excellent. So the format of the interview, similar to the previous sessions, is that I will ask a few questions, uh, perhaps for 20 minutes or so, and then we will have Q&A from the participants, uh, that uh, you participants can write your questions, and you can vote them up. Uh, we'll read on that basis the questions, and John will answer uh, to you. Currently, we have 47 participants to uh, our interview session. So without any further ado, and with your permission, John, I'll go to the questions. And first, congratulations. Uh, it's the first time that we have you on your new your role <laughs> at the CSBC sessions virtually, obviously, this time due to the situation that we are all facing. And uh, so uh, apart from congratulations, I want to ask you to tell us a little bit about my facts and the role it plays in Canada's innovation ecosystem, despite the fact that we know many of our audience are familiar with my tax, but it is a very good start that you as a new CEO to describe it for us. Well, thank you, Meridad. It's a great pleasure to describe my tax. I should start by saying that uh, as with everybody nowadays, I'm working from, uh, you know, my youngest son's former bedroom uh, here in the uh, traditional territories, traditional unceded territories of the Coast Salish people in Vancouver and a uh, great pleasure to be here. Um, my tax is a little bit over 20 years old and we've been in the business of promoting innovation in Canada to address the uh, productivity uh, and uh, competitive challenge that Canadian industry and not-for-profits face. We do this, we've always done this by creating partnerships and the main partnerships that we create are between universities and industry uh, or universities and not-for-profits. We've diversified recently by creating, we're starting to create partnerships between colleges and polytechnics and the same organizations. And we're hoping to create partnerships with municipalities in the near future. So there's a lot of diversity in the way that we do this. The partnerships are driven by student internships. And so we take students out of the university setting, but not completely out because we want them to do research and innovation projects where they work simultaneously between their university and the industry that they're working in. So these are research driven innovation projects. They typically form part of the students academic research, uh, their thesis work uh, or, or equivalent. And so this is a very successful formula. Last year, we organized 10,000 of these internships. Uh, this year, because of greatly increased federal funding and provincial funding, we're planning on organizing 17,000 of these. So big ramp up in activities in these difficult times. This is amazing. Congratulations on that. Uh, let me ask you this. You joined my tax on uh, in late February, I believe, 2020, uh, officially as the CEO, uh, the scientific director. That was an interesting time because after a couple of weeks, the workplace uh, workplaces disrupted 
across Canada, there were shutdowns and pause into operations, etc. Can you reflect on your first five months uh, in your new role? <laughs> yeah, it seems it seems a lot longer than five months, but you're right. It is. I joined uh, about mid February, uh, and and the first month was kind of normal. You know, I was getting on and off planes. I was going to meetings. I was visiting. My tax is a distributed national organization. I'm based in Vancouver, but we have major offices in uh, Montreal and Toronto, and an office in Ottawa. So I was visiting the offices. I went to my very first board meeting, and then the pandemic was declared, and now I'm in my son's former bedroom, and have been for four months now. So uh, after the first quasi-normal month, because we all knew that bad things were coming, but we weren't sure quite what that meant, and I think that's that's a universal feeling. We, like every other organization, pivoted immediately to remote work. That went exceedingly well. I mean, my tax being distributed already had a lot of remote work and, and video conferencing anyways. So that was relatively painless. And we got very, very busy. And not just because of, I mean, initially, direct response to the COVID-19 crisis, uh, trying to launch initiatives that would address the immediate crisis, uh, talking to our friends in Ottawa and the provincial capitals about our role in the economic recovery. Uh, then, you know, we got extra funding from the federal government, uh, which made us, uh, obligated us to increase our offerings, but also allowed us to do a lot of things that uh, we couldn't do otherwise. And so then we got extremely busy. And so it's been a very, very busy uh, four months since we all locked down. Uh, and I would say it's been an incredibly enjoyable five months. I've really, really appreciated working with the team at MyTax. It's, it's been a fun organization to be part of. Um, we all know that science and scientific research, of course, is a key element of a healthy innovation ecosystem. Uh, from your point of view, how has this pandemic affected innovation in Canada? Oh, you know, it's, I think the jury's still out. I mean, we don't know what the, as the pandemic progresses, I think we're coming to terms with the reality that, that we're in this for a while. I think initially when we all went into our bedrooms and, you know, dining rooms to, to work from home, you know, we sort of hoped that, well, we'll put up with this for a few months and then life will return to normal. Well, life isn't going to return to normal. University laboratories and industry labs all shut down immediately in, uh, in March, they're just now beginning to reopen. Um, the government fortunately has pumped a lot of money into the system, both the university research system into us at MyTax, into industry uh, to preserve activity. Um, that will not go on forever. Um, and so right now there's the, the closure of, of laboratories. Uh, innovation does require laboratory work in addition to remote work, and so that's there's been a there's been a pause, uh, which for a few months is is not fatal. But as this goes on, and if there's if there's a second wave and we have to close laboratories again, it will have an impact on innovation. Um, the main concern is the cash crunch. Um, as I say, government has been pumping money into both the um, the granting councils and into industry and into organizations like ours, uh, that's kept things going. Um, what will happen in the future is, is of course, of concern. And so let me go more specific about the impact on my tax programs and uh, delivery. Uh, has this been significant change in terms of the priorities, programs, and adjustments in, in, in those as a result of the pandemic in my tax? Yeah, um, so my tax runs, as I said, student internships. And so immediately student internships that were in a laboratory setting had to be postponed or changed. Uh, so we pivoted to internships that were that could be done remotely. And, and fortunately, many of them could be. So there was that. My tax also has substantial international programs. We're, we're heavily involved in promoting innovation um, by connecting Canadian universities and industries with, with overseas partners. 
those are all on hold, obviously, and we don't know when we're going to be able to have students moving again. We're, we're optimistic that it can be in the not too distant future, but we just simply don't know. So the international programs have been basically put on hold. Um, obviously, we wanted to respond as, as everybody, the Granting Council, Genome Canada, everybody responded with specific calls for COVID-19 related projects. We did that as well. Um, even in advance of the increased funding from the federal government, we just thought it was the right thing to do. Uh, we launched a COVID-19 specific uh, program where we promised very rapid reviews. We review all of our projects, obviously. Um, so we initiated a system where we could review within, within a week or two and get money out the door quickly for projects that could have an impact right away. Um, those labs, of course, were allowed to stay open, but there was a lot of remote projects uh, that could be that could be done. We expected a few hundred uh, uh, internships this way. Uh, latest count were over 1,300 internships. You know, hundreds of projects. Uh, you know, well over well over 300 uh, companies involved. Uh, over 600 students doing these internships. So the the demand for that has been overwhelming. Uh, the final thing is that, um, well, not the final thing, but another thing we did was we reduced the cost for small and medium enterprises to engage in these internships. Everything that we do is a true partnership. It's cost shared um, between the MITAX, largely federal funding, and the industry funding. And so for small and medium enterprises, we were very sensitive to, the, to their cash shortages and so we offered internships at a discount that's also been very very heavily subscribed to so a lot of things like that uh, a lot of things were made possible by the extra 40 million dollars that was provided to us um, at the end of april and in terms of overall business we're we're swamped i mean we have and this is this is gratifying that the innovation system for now is is alive and well in canada a lot of companies pivoted because of the uh, COVID-19. We've encouraged them to do that. We're providing business students support so that they can develop business plans uh, as they pivot uh, because of this crisis. But for now, and here I'll knock on my wooden desk, things are going well, but we've got a lot of demand for our programs. There's a lot of need clearly for this sort of innovation uh, support. Uh, great to hear that. And uh, so let me, uh, many students, who have been hard, hit hard by the pandemic, you know, uh, because of the economic shutdown, obviously. Uh, you mentioned in parts in terms of the flow of the money, et cetera, but I want to uh, see how is MITAC responding to students uh, who are in need and their workplace has been shut down and uh, others. Yeah, that, that obviously was and is a big concern of ours. Uh, that was actually the reason if, if, people cast their mind back to, well, we, we paid a lot of attention to the April 22nd announcement by the Prime Minister, but, the, but our $40 million was allocated as part of, an, of this very large $9 billion student aid package that uh, the federal government uh, put out in late April. Um, and so we were very focused on preventing, first of all, keeping students in the innovation ecosystem, keeping them supporting uh, the companies doing their research at the universities. We rolled out uh, using our own resources largely and, and some federal funding. We rolled out a program specifically aimed at um, university students to provide them with summer uh, research jobs. Uh, we called them research training awards. We've broadened our offerings, as I referred to, to business students uh, so they can help companies develop business plans. So we're very focused on keeping students um, employed in good jobs. These internships are, are you know, excellent jobs, uh, well paid. And we're now appealing uh, to the federal government and provincial government, our funding partners for support to prevent um, what I would call a lost generation of students, uh, students who graduate into this, into these tough economic times. We would like, my tax and others, I'm sure, would like to do our part to, to just keep these students working in the innovation ecosystem, uh, keeping Canada moving forward until the economy can, can truly recover, which I don't think anybody expects is going to happen in the next few months. It's going to, we're, we're in this for the next few years. 
Okay. Um, I see that there are a lot of uh, questions, by the way, John is being asked in the Q&A uh, chat room and I'll get, uh, go to them first, but let me ask you this uh, last question on my end. Uh, this is regarding the science policy uh, fellowship program, uh, some mm -hmm. signature program in, in my text that we are all very proud of, very supportive of, and uh, uh, has been calling to, to be established, uh, at least from my end and CSPC, and very happy and pleased to see now becomes one of the regular programs of my yeah. text, and congratulations to you and the team uh, on that. I'm just wondering if uh, the, uh, in terms of the role it's playing, bringing science into policy making, do you see any impact of the pandemic specifically on that program? Well, in terms of in terms of demand for the program, no. I mean, we we we're gratified that there still is a demand for these these very qualified, uh, talented people to work, uh, typically with government partners, uh, developing uh, you know evidence based policy, which is good. Um, we did issue a specific call for for COVID nineteen related mm -hmm. um, science policy fellows. That was well received. Uh, we weren't overwhelmed with demand, but this is a very selective program, as you know. I mean, it's it's we really want the best people um, having an impact. And and you're right. We've we we ran this program as as my tax likes to do in calmer times. Uh, we we do prefer to to test drive potential programs for for a while and then evaluate them. And so that's the way the science policy program uh, was rolled out. Uh, we're very pleased with the results. We did an evaluation, um, and it's now a regular program. It's never going to be a giant program. I mean, we're not, you know, doing 17,000 science policy fellows, um, but I think it's a high impact program. Um, I'm certainly very pleased with it, and and it will continue. But no, the answer is that we have not seen, you know, a disappearance in demand, which is which I'm very happy, and I think we've seen that with both provincial and federal governments that. Right. Canada's success in the pandemic is because people have paid attention to science, you know, as opposed to other jurisdictions that we don't need to name who've decided that science is sort of secondary to, to partisan politics. I've, I've been very happy with the, the response of all levels of Canadian government paying attention to science in this crisis. Okay, that's good. Okay, now let's go to the uh, questions that have already been posted and upvoted in the Q&A box in the bottom of the zone screen. And by the way, it's just Q&A uh, box that you can write your questions and you can vote them up. While I am reading this, the first question I want to ask the CSPC office, please to uh, launch a question about the sector that the participants are coming from and I appreciate if you could please respond to that survey question which sector you're coming from nonprofit private government academia media or others I very much appreciate that so uh, there are a couple of questions which I read one of them is similar in the same uh, line of thinking is about the international training program uh, the question is uh, the it says, uh, I am a GRI 2020 student whose my tax internship was canceled this summer. On, on behalf of other interns, I was wondering if my tax will be keeping its relationship with other countries going forward. How will it be avoiding any uh, affectation for GRI 2021 and potential international students hoping to pursue a master's on their GGF? Excellent question. And, and yes, one of the tragedies of the pandemic is, uh, for those of you who don't know, GRI, Global Inc. Research Internships, bring unbelievably talented um, upper year undergraduate students to Canadian universities to do uh, a summer research internship. We had to cancel that program. It was a very painful decision. And this particular student asking the question is part of the 800 students who, you know, had their dreams shattered by the pandemic. And we did discuss ways of, of reducing that pain. Uh, we discussed with our international partners and really because of the limitations on timing of the program, there was little we could do. Going forward, I'm happy to say that our international partners have maintained their enthusiasm for this program. And in fact, they've increased their enthusiasm, partly because they didn't have to pay for any 
interns this past summer or this summer. Um, so we're optimistically going forward with the uh, 2021 cohort. We're accepting, we've, we've gotten a large demand from uh, potential Canadian supervisors for these students. We're going to be accepting applications from overseas students to participate in these internships. But as everybody appreciates, we are completely not in control of public health recommendations about whether people can travel or not. So it will be up to, well, it'll be up to mother nature whether the summer 2021 cohort uh, can go ahead as planned. Um, we all hope for a vaccine. We all hope for a reduction. But frankly, when you look at what's going on in many of our partner countries, um, especially when you look at what's going on in um, South America, South and Central America, uh, in India, for example, uh, there's a lot of concern about whether this pandemic is going to be under control. If it's not, we'll make a decision in the winter as we as we had to this past year. Uh, but we're being optimistic. So that's not, I mean, <laughs> these are uncertain times is, is the best answer I can give. But optimism is what uh, what we deal in at MyTax. Right. And, and John, on, on that, uh, uh, aligned with that question, there are several others that indicating that the, uh, the 2020 uh, cohort was cancelled, but you are receiving application for 2021. What Absolutely. is going to happen for 2020 applicants? Is there anything that can be done, for example, bring them to 2021? Or uh, what is going to happen to 2020 uh, successful applicants? The 2020 successful applicants if they qualify for the program and, and, you know, we're funded by the governments for specific purpose for these global link research internships. And, and we can't deviate from that, from that purpose. I mean, we have funding agreements like, like every government funded organization. And so there's a certain qualification that's necessary for these students to participate if they're qualified. And that means that they're not going to be graduated from their undergraduate programs uh, next May then they can they have to reapply i'm afraid um we're not just going to carry them forward um but we promise that if they're qualified and they've already been awarded in 2020 that the process for you know essentially re-awarding will be relatively pro forma but they must they must reapply so that we can ensure that they are qualified in the summer of 2021. okay that's good there were by the way a number of questions regarding that uh, the 2020 and versus future uh, applications that you answered. Thank you for that. Uh, yeah. There was actually one of the questions in my list, which I uh, now I see part of the questions here by the audience. Uh, I want to ask you about the impact uh, due to COVID-19 on the EDI program as well and uh, equity, diversity, inclusion, how they have been affected by the uh, COVID-19 pandemic. And also, in addition to that, a question by Yanet Valet uh, uh, Tejeria, if I'm not, uh, I hope I pronounced the name correctly. My apologies if I have not. What is your commitment uh, for your mandate in terms of the equity and diversity? Okay, so, so there's a couple of sub questions layered in there. So, so first of all, there's been no specific impact on equity, diversity and inclusion caused by the COVID-19. I mean, it's, it's obviously had an impact on all of our programs, but as I said earlier, we're busy. Um, we have for several years ago, I mean, my, my predecessor Alejandro Adem uh, launched an indigenous communities initiative uh, which I, he was very enthusiastic about. I am very enthusiastic about it. And we, we plan to ramp that up. And that's, that's of course, part of, in Canada, um, that's a very important part of any equity, diversity, and inclusion uh, initiative. So, so that's underway. Uh, we're hiring and have hired um, extra expertise in that area uh, amongst our business development team. In terms of where I see my tax going, um, we're just now, it got a bit delayed by the pandemic, but we're launching a strategic planning process. Uh, the time has come for a new strategic plan and not just because there's a new CEO, but because our you know, strategic plan and current funding agreement are coming to an end. We have already actually the first part of that strategic planning process to be launched. And, and let's face it, it's really because of the Black Lives Matter 
uh, protests and the the added concern about systemic racism uh, that's come to the fore in recent months. But the EDI part of our strategic planning is actually has already been launched, and that will be a very important part of our plan. It will have an impact on on my tax internally, and it will have an impact on our programs. And so we're looking into things that we can do beyond the indigenous effort in the short term. And I can promise everybody listening that it's going to be a very important part of our uh, strategic plan going forward. Thank you. Uh, there is a question, how might tax considered expanding or making a parallel science policy program for students who are not in PhD programs, uh, for example, undergrads or professional degrees? Yeah, and I just noticed uh, somebody somebody popped up in the chat. It popped up on my screen about postdoctoral fellows, and and I should make it absolutely clear that when I say students, I don't I don't exclude postdoctoral fellows. I could use trainees, but that's sort of an inside baseball term. So I apologize to the postdoctoral fellows who are listening. Uh, we have a program, Elevate, which is dedicated to postdoctoral fellows. We have industrial postdoctoral fellowships, and the Accelerate program, of course, allows postdoctoral fellows to participate. So. I'm, I'm, I, it's, it's unintentional, but I didn't mention postdoctoral fellows. Um, the expansion beyond uh, uh, graduate students and postdoctoral fellows, like standard uh, high level researchers, um, has been in the works for a while at MITAX. Uh, we've had the, the college program, which has now become a regular program, was, was again a pilot program uh, with a number of colleges. With undergraduates, similarly, we've been given authorization uh, with SAGEPS in uh, Quebec. Uh, we're going to start working with them. Um, and so we are expanding our offerings. However, I would caution people who, who think that this may be that uh, we're, we're becoming a, you know, a co-op job placement agency. That's not my tax mandate. It never will be my tax mandate. These are all innovation related. I mean, the, everything we do is to drive innovation in Canada. And so, but I think it's logical to, to expand to, you know, innovation is driven by more than PhD students and postdoctoral fellows. So that's, that's the, the reason for expanding into these other areas. Okay. Uh, there's a question by an anonymous attendee. What is the regional distribution of internship? If you have that data. Yeah, well, I don't have, I, I won't quote numbers because you can go to our website and, and discover the numbers. Obviously, we're coast to coast. And in fact, coast to coast to coast now because we've signed an agreement recently with uh, Yukon Territory and we're going to be discussing with Nunavut an agreement. Um, so we place internships in all 10 provinces and soon in uh, Yukon Territory. So that's... You know, we're a national organization. We have business development people, again, from St. John's to Victoria. Most of the internships, obviously, are where most of the economic activity is in uh, Quebec and Ontario. However, all the provinces, um, and, and we get funding from, from all 10 provinces plus Yukon Territory. And frankly, the provinces, if they put money into our budget, they expect us to deliver internships in the province. And so, you know, when we accept money from, from our provincial funders, we commit to generating internships in that province. And, and you know, we've, we've always hit those commitment targets. So. Very good. Okay. Um, there is a qu clarification uh, uh, answer needed by some of the uh, one of the participants regarding again the GR, uh, GRI program. Mm -hmm. Question is, I think you answered that, but just for the clarification, they asked the question, uh, the, if the current and selected GRI 2020 uh, uh, people, applicants, be eligible for 2021 uh, fellowships, can they apply for that program again? Yeah, I, I mean, if they are eligible and the eligibility criteria are, 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 are given, um, then absolutely we would encourage them to apply. We, we don't want to lose these students if, if they're still qualified to, to be part of the program. Okay, well, uh, that's good, thank you. And uh, there is an invitation for you for regarding an STEM fellowship, big data, 
uh, challenge inter-university big data challenge that uh, will send that to you for your review to participate in that survey they are thinking if that can be considered as one of the programs that be included in my tax program is that uh, that are there some possibilities in that regards uh, dr hopper well not not knowing the specifics of this one i won't comment on it but but i will say that um you know Two of the programs that, that we're now rolling out nationally won the research training awards that I talked about um, and these business, what we're calling business strategy internships, uh, they both came to us as suggestions from our partner universities. And so we are always, and as you know, the science policy fellowships came as a suggestion um, you know, from Sally Otto initially and others, uh, I think yourself included, um, and so we're always open to, to clever ideas of things we can do. We, we have limitations in what we can do because the treasury board signs off on our money and they're, they're strict about what we can spend our money on. But if it fits within our mandate, um, then we can at least try it out as a pilot if it's, if it's of interest to us. So yeah, we welcome suggestions. Excellent, okay. And how is my tax capacity being tested to handle the greater demand and expansion in government funding. So that probably refers to the $40 million uh, we were generously awarded by the government, which was a 50% increase in our funding from the uh, federal government, by the way, for those who don't know our detailed budget. Um, it was a little frightening to think about in the midst of a you know, <laughs> global economic crisis, increasing our business by more than 50%. Um, but we have a very, you know, I'll emphasize that a very hardworking team at MyTax. Uh, they are very dedicated and they're very entrepreneurial, which is we should be as an innovation supporting organization. Um, everybody's been busy and I'm happy to say that uh, we're actually ahead of schedule for, for achieving this very ambitious target. So, you know, I think it's, it's hard work. It's clever people. I mean, an organization is, is only as good as it's, uh, as its staff first and foremost and its partners secondarily and we've got good partners and we've got fabulous staff excellent question by janet hallival which of course you know and oh uh, hi janet <laughs> there are board of directors of cspc she's asking the question uh, what is the extent of uh, social sciences involvement in the my tax programming and the disciplines that are most active in the innovation sphere? Oh boy. Well, the disciplines most active are, are the STEM disciplines. Um, you know, most of the industry demand is for, you know, technical people. And so most of the internships that we award are technically based engineering, computer science, all of the, you know, the physical sciences, what, what you would expect a lot in the life sciences. Um, However, an increasing fraction of our business, so to speak, is in the social sciences. We've, we've been driving uh, involvement of social science researchers for a long time. Uh, a lot of the response to the COVID-19 crisis was, was from the social sciences. I think now that we've, we've had our mandate expanded uh, to include work with the municipalities, as I said earlier, we can work with uh, not-for-profits, uh, have for a number of years, we can now work with foundations. We are expecting uh, the social science component of our innovation-based um, internships to increase. And I think that would be a good thing. So it's still, a, you know, 20%-ish of our business. So most of it, the vast majority is in technical areas, but uh, it's an increasing part and we're driving to make it uh, even more. And I think you know, when you think about the indigenous strategy, uh, when you think about working with municipalities, foundations, and not-for-profits, a lot of that work will be in the social sciences. So we're optimistic that it will increase, um, and but it's a reasonable fraction of our business currently. Very good. And uh, there is a question that uh, says the current circumstances uh, is impacting on uh, the international students coming to Canada for graduate studies as well as undergraduate students, uh, which will impact the innovation pipeline so they cannot come obviously to the country. What is your thinking to fill this gap 
from national resources, I mean, the, the domestic students and applicants over the near future to fill the gap. What do you think about that? Boy, well, I think that the, I mean, first of all, I will say that, that you know, in addition to our obvious uh, student mobility programs, which are largely uh, international students coming to Canada for, for research internships or for accelerate projects, most of the, most half the internships uh, currently are awarded to international students who are resident in Canada. They're studying in Canadian uh, universities and colleges. So we plan on obviously maintaining that. Uh, we think that this is a very important part of the talent pipeline for Canada. If we're promoting Canadian innovation, we need clever people to innovate. And uh, of course, international students are, are an important part of that. Um, we worry, as the universities worry, about whether more international students can come to this country. Um, I will say the federal government has enlightened uh, immigration and visa policies. Uh, that helps. But if students can't travel, they can't travel. So we are working with our partners in the universities and government in doing our part to, to make Canada an attractive place for international students to come, not just to study, but also to work. So we're committed to that. We, we recognize that it's, and in fact, you know, the governments fund us for this in addition to innovation because because governments across Canada realize that the international students, uh, the immigrants to Canada are an incredibly important part of the innovation ecosystem that drives innovation in Canada. Thank you, John. I'm going back to a question that is asked a couple of times regarding some clarification. Again, <clears throat> apparently the GRI uh, the <laughs> program, uh, canceled in 2020 are very active here. Yes, they're yes, yes. They are qualified for GGF, uh, Global Inc. Graduate Fellowship Program. That's a different program from GGRI. That's right. So are they qualified for that program uh, to, to apply for that? If they have not done a Global Inc. Research Internship, then the short answer is no, sadly. I mean, the GGF program, this Global Inc. Graduate Fellowships Program, is intended for alumni of the Global Inc. Research Internship Program, the GRI. So... So if they've done a GRI internship, absolutely, they're qualified for a GGF. Okay, that's good. Uh, question by Jeffrey uh, Kerlinston. Uh, do you think, do you think the relatively low participation of social sciences, uh, you know, disciplines comes from the supply side, the academics, or the demand side, the companies? After all, marketing and communications, sales and other human skills are important to companies. And as you know, John, this is my addition to this question, by the way, just to be fair, is that uh, you know, the, the social sciences graduate uh, play an important role in terms of the innovation pipeline, taking executive roles and other roles in the uh, companies and uh, making advancement for the innovation in those companies. Uh, how do you respond to that? Is it from a supply side or from the demand side? I would say more from the demand side, and that's uh, and and that's simply a necessary result of of the the previous programs at my tax were very much focused on you know joint university industry research projects um, focused on PhD students and postdocs, jointly funded. And so there was kind of a technical bias to that. Um, we think that with the expansion into, uh, first of all, the ability to work with municipalities and uh, foundations and not-for-profits, and also these business strategy internships, which are precisely about business planning, marketing, uh, IP strategies, that will involve almost exclusively people with a social sciences background. And so it's, it's essentially we're changing our programs um, to allow for, for a broader definition of, of innovation support, which I think is important, and also driving um, social sciences because I think we're seeing with the public health crisis um, that we're currently in the midst of, 
there's a need for a scientific solution, but frankly, there's a need for, for a social solution. I mean, why aren't people socially distancing? Why are they jamming into bars to infect one another? These are social problems. These are not scientific problems. We understand the science really well. So I think that that's, you know, we, we hope that the expansion of, of programs will address the demand side, but I think it is largely a demand. It, previously, it's, it's demand driven that, that we simply don't have the partnerships uh, in the same, to the same extent that in the technical areas we do. Excellent. There's an interesting question by uh, uh, Damiler Faniran. I hope I pronounced the name correctly again. Uh, my apologies if I mispronounced. Is it possible to expand my tax role as a national institution uh, in uh, Canadian foreign policy and scientific diplomacy through a professional fellowship targeted at uh, not just, you know, those studying in Canada, but young STEM innovators, social entrepreneurs, and young leaders from the global south? This is a very interesting question. Both. That's a really interesting question. And I, I mean, <laughs> The first answer would be, I'm not sure. It would, uh, I would need to ponder that. It would need to be part of our, you know, as I keep going back to, I mean, I don't want to blame government. They're very generous supporters of us, but they, they fund us for specific things. So we would have to ensure that it fits with our mandate. I would encourage the person asking the question to, to send me an email uh, with this idea. Uh, very simple to get to me. I'm J Hepburn, all one word at mytax.ca. Send me an email. Describe what you think, and uh, we can dis we can discuss it internally. But we are pondering, and it's and frankly, it's part of the uh, the the EDI discussion. What is my tax role in the global south? Um, you know, what what does it mean to promote innovation uh, internationally? And I think that this is. This is an, it's an interesting suggestion. So send it in and uh, we'll ponder it. There you go. You have an uh, open, uh, uh, you know, <laughs> uh, advice from John is, uh, um, is there to listen to your suggestion. And if I want to use the opportunity for the advantage of science diplomacy, as you know that CSPC has been very keen on this topic in various panel sessions and topics, and we can discuss the expansion of a science the Science Diplomacy Fellowship, John, with the support of Global <laughs> Canada. We can discuss that at a later point. So is that an offer for partnership, Meridad? I, I, I heard an offer for <laughs> partnership. That's, that's very good. <laughs> I'll send you an email and describe my proposal. <laughs> <laughs> that's good. Okay, so we have a very interesting discussion. By the way, thank you for all the participants. And we have currently, we, we were at 60, now 55 participants. And we have a couple of more minutes for discussion. There are other questions. I just want to make sure we answer some of those before ending our session. A question by David Castle, as you know. Uh, oh. David is asking, helping help, uh, having helped the BC government with uh, SPF, program in BC. I hope we'll see the, BC, uh, see the BC and other provincial governments get engaged in the program. I think he means the Science Policy Fellowship Program. Yep. It is fair to say that COVID-19 has shut down the need for science policy uh, at the provincial level. My thanks can lead the way. Another suggestion, John, what do you think about that? Well, I mean, BC government was in fact an early partner in the Science Policy Fellowships as I understand it. It's and the well first before my time. Yeah, and so we would we would love to re-engage with the BC government and have more. I mean, there's always a need for for uh, science advice to uh, to policy. So yeah, we're quite enthusiastic, and so David uh, David can work with me uh, <laughs> and try. And, I mean, there's lots of lots of discussions with the BC government, and and I I will stress as I always am careful to that the BC government has always been a generous supporter of my tax, and we appreciate the support. But, you know, the science policy fellows in, in Victoria would be a nice addition to the, uh, to the mandate. There you go. So there is another uh, <laughs> kind of re receptive this by John. Thank you for that. So before ending our program, I want to ask uh, people at the CSBC office, please launch a question regarding our performance. And I really appreciate if people, the participants could answer the question, how we perform in this uh, in, in this interview and uh, let us know if you were uh, good, bad, and if you have any comments, please reach out to 
us and let us know. But uh, I think this is uh, the last question. And uh, about the, uh, um, let me just see. Okay, so uh, what are you seeing from the ground? What are the greatest needs that innovative companies have during this pandemic from your observation, John, with, uh, hearing and seeing the private sector level? What are the needs? Well, I think, I mean, what I've heard and what our, I mean, our business development team, which is about uh, 75 people spread across the country, as I alluded to earlier, what we've been hearing is, is obviously talent um, is a big concern, uh, being able, and, and mostly them being able to pay talent and preserve talent in their organizations in the midst of what could be a prolonged financial crisis. So it, it ultimately gets back to cash. Can they, can they keep the investment income coming in? Uh, a lot of these companies, most of the companies we deal with are small and medium enterprises. They are in danger of, of running out of money. So I think that's the biggest concern. And it's, it's essentially, can we maintain the talent pipeline to keep the innovation going? Um, in addition to all of the other issues, you know, supply chains and labs closing and, and everything else that, that all companies are dealing with. I think the innovation companies are dealing with just, they need cash to keep going. So that's, that's I would say the number one concern. Okay, that's good. And if I may, uh, one more question, which liked uh, four times, but people from uh, Wardana Narula uh, saying that DAAD organization, had mm -hmm. provided a certificate stating that all 2020 DOD fellows could not complete their internship because of the COVID-19, so, but they are entitled to a certificate. The question is, would it be possible for my tax to do the same? Oh, another interesting suggestion. Um, that could be done. I would, I would encourage those on the line to get in touch with the international office at my tax to to check that but um i don't see any reason why you could not list certainly you could list on your cvs that you were awarded the global link research internship and you weren't able to complete it because of the COVID 19 but uh, in terms of issuing certificates we've we've not done it in the past but we've never had a pandemic in the past so it's an interesting suggestion so again send it in and uh, it can be considered Excellent. Thank you, John. Um, um, again, a flow of qu interesting questions coming in. And if you allow me to read one more, uh, oh, that's fine. Uh, he's saying uh, thank you, John and Mirda. My thanks have been a fantastic source for community uh, generation for so many graduate students. I understand that the business internship currently requires a student to be associated with a business school. Are there plans to expand the business internship to help individuals without a business background to pivot the career path to complement their skill set? A low innovation uh, penetration via uh, through diversity. And so those without a business skills to get into that. Yeah, and I guess it depends on on how you define business skills. So so the initial suggestion came to us from from a business school so they were obviously concerned about their own business students we're considering expanding the program we're in discussion with law schools about expanding it to law students and marketing you know you don't need to be a business student to understand marketing necessarily i guess it would be a question of what are the qualifications of the student and how does it support innovation per se? Um, there's loads of ways to support a uh, company's success that don't necessarily involve innovation. So, you know, my tax has to be supporting research-based innovation. That's our mandate. Um, so I would not want to exclude the possibility of students who are not at a, you know, qualified, and accredited business school we're, we're expanding beyond that but but i wouldn't want to give you know saying that anybody with a clever idea can can get an internship that's that's not that's outside of our mandate excellent okay thank you so uh john i must tell you that we set a record you answered the most number of questions and <laughs> the most number of questions among the interviews that we have had in the past few uh, months and i thank you for your patience and your questions and uh if we get more questions we direct them to your colleagues at my and uh so that it was great to have you 
on board with us before giving you the last word i just want to mention that uh please uh you can see the by the way the records of these sessions at our uh, website my colleagues will post the website in the chat line take a look and our next session will be tuesday july 21st uh at 12 at noon uh, there is a panel the title of the panel is lifting the curtain on ken Kojen project as you know, the Can Cogent project recently funded uh, by Government of Canada, Genome Canada, and a few others. A few others are involved with that. This is a panel of organizations who are involved in this Can Cogent project, including its new executive director. So please join us on Tuesday, July 21st at noon Eastern time, and we would love to have your participation and answering your questions. And the last word to uh, to you, John. And uh, before that, I want to thank you on behalf of CSBC for being with us. Well, I'll I'll reverse the thanks. Thank you for having me. It was a actually it was a very interesting session. You you never wonder, you never know when you when you start these whether there's going to be any questions at all. Looks like uh, there were a number of questions, and so I I really appreciate the questions, and the suggestions. And uh, as I say, keep them coming. Um, my tax is you know dedicated and uh, not just funded to, but we're dedicated to promoting innovation in Canada. We're looking for better ways of doing that. Uh, in addition to working with uh, more and more partners and students. Um, and we're hoping for ongoing support. I'll put in a pitch to anybody from government listening. Uh, we need support of government to do these things. Uh, we're hoping to be full participants in the economic recovery that uh, we're all praying for right now. Once, uh, now that the crisis is it's nowhere near over, but uh, we all need to work hard in economic recovery. And my tax hopes to be an important part of keeping innovation going through this uh, dark period of history and, and coming out on the other side as a strong, innovative nation. Uh, that's, that's what we live to do at my tax. Thank you very much, John, and look forward to having you in our future sessions as well as the annual conference where yes. my tax will be actively participating and look forward to seeing you, your colleagues and the science policy fellows and and uh, please note that active uh, my tax will be very active in our annual conference in November. Once again, thank you, John, and to all colleagues at my tax and uh, the CSBC office and thanks to you who participated, uh, took your time off your busy schedule and participated in this session. Look forward to see you next Tuesday. Have a good day. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye now.